In harmony with nature With a past that's rich and deep It's a place where the earth's secrets Are ours to keep From 1897 to the doors of time Where the smell of stands In a rhythm in a rhyme In the spirit of permaculture We find a way to find The love of land and legacy Where the future redefines Okay, everyone. Hope everyone is having a lovely day on this 20th day of February 2024. Hello, I'm your host, Doc. We're going to talk about designing your garden today. So if you're new to this, welcome. Thank you. Hope you, uh, Hope I find you guys all well. So this is the Garden Revolution show. We're going to, uh, it'll be about, it's roughly going to be a little slideshow. It'll last roughly somewhere in the vicinity of 30 minutes or so. We're going to talk a lot. We're going to talk about permaculture principles. We're going to help to help you figure out ways to design your garden using permaculture. We're going to learn a little bit about me, who I am, and more about, if you like this kind of stuff, places that you will be able to find this. So without further ado, let's jump in. First, let's give a little background of who I am, because some of you might be wondering, who is this guy? Who is Doc? My name is also Justin. So I live in southern West Virginia. Uh, I teach permaculture. I teach farming. Uh, I'm the director of a 501c3, the Mavis Institute. Um, I, so I'm a master gardener. I'm a, a garden life coach. I'm a farmer and a rancher. If you want to know the difference between that, farmers grow plants, ranchers grow animals. I live here in Appalachia. I have an absolute passion for sustainable living. I've been doing this for well over a decade. So I've been living down here for almost 20 years. Um, even before I moved down here when I lived up in Ohio, I also practiced a lot of permaculture principles. So I've dedicated my life to enhancing ecological awareness and community empowerment. So what that means is I am trying to make your life better and also bring you awareness of how awesome the world is around us and how we can keep doing this. So uh, I'm glad you're here to join me on this fun adventure this evening. Or if you're watching this later, thanks for watching and sticking around. So. Just some more. I'm a beekeeper, herbalist, wildcrafter. I do absolutely love foraging. So animal husbandry, 
I'm a certified master gardener in the state of West Virginia and Virginia. I'm a master per permaculturist. I'm a garden coach. I have 25 years of raising chickens. That includes raising chickens in the city and raising chickens in the suburbs. So I like to make fun concoctions. I'm a wellness instructor and I practice healing. So I do believe in some of the uh, woo. So there's some woo that I can teach you if this is the kind of stuff that you're interested in. So what is permaculture? Some of you are brand new to the term permaculture. You've never heard it before. So what is permaculture? Well, permaculture is blended between permanent and agriculture. It blends it together, and that's kind of where it began. That is uh, back, I think, in the 70s, two Australians came up with this term, and they kind of blended it together. But it's, it's leading more into a culture now. So it's leading into a lifestyle. It's not just about raising veggies in your backyard. It's about looking at the world differently, finding ways to allow the world that we live in on how to make it more permanent, but learning from how the world around us works. So it's a full circle approach. Um, it is, as you see there, about building ecosystems, being sustainable, and working in harmony with your mind, your body, your spirit, your soul, and the world around you. So it's core principles and how you can apply them even in your backyard or in everyday parts of your life. So we're going to jump in. These are, the, these are six of the 12 principles. We're just going to kind of gloss over this. I have a whole nother show where we're going to talk in depth about each of the different principles. But we're just going to cover the principles right now. Principles are, hello, Ivy on DLive. We're going to talk about the principles are observation, catch and store energy, obtain a yield, apply self-regulation, and accept feedback. Use value, renewable resources, produce no waste. So what that is, is very simple. It's observing, using your eyes, catching and storing energy, pretty self-explanatory, having yield, get something in return, looking, applying self, applying self-reflection and getting feedback. That's making sure that you're always growing, you're doing something and getting something back and forth in return. Producing no waste is trying to do the best of your ability to not have more work for yourself. So producing no waste because nature produces no waste. And uh, use valuable, use value and renewable resources. That's just using stuff you've got. So that's that. That's the first six. Here's the next, this designing from patterns to detail. Pretty much let nature help design your path. Uh, integrating rather than segregating. Finding ways to use what's around you and put it and make it work together with your farm using slow and small solutions. So slow and steady wins the race. Uh, use and value diversity. So don't put, egg, but don't put your eggs in all in one basket. The edge and the value of margin. So we're gonna talk more about, um, we're really gonna talk more about the value of using edge and what actually being on the edge means and why edge is one of my absolute favorite things. We're also going to, and, and creating and using responses to change. So this is as you see things change and as you see things evolve, we're going to talk more about um, how you use that to your advantage and how you can make that help you achieve what you are looking for to achieve in the world. So we're going to also talk about the ethics because this is probably where we need to spend a little bit of time. This is where a lot of the confusion comes out in permaculture, but this is where it, transcends from just being gardening to a lifestyle. So we have earth care, fair share, and people care. So let's start with the easy one up top. That's earth care. That's pretty much getting in there and not destroying the world around you. It's kind of making, the easiest way to look at it is making the world better. So going out in your backyard and making the soil better. Going out in your backyard and planting some trees, growing some things, giving stuff for the animals, making the world that you live in just a little bit better. Easy. Every one of us can do it. It can be from picking up trash. It can be from re replanting seeds. It can be from just doing environmentally conscious things so that you're not pouring toxic gick into the ground. Next, we're going to go over to the red one, and that is people care. Again, pretty easy to do. Don't be a dick. Be nice to people. Help people when you can. And understand that everybody is going through some type of different life scenario um, and so that is what people care is about then we're going to jump over to fair share fair share is the one that gets most people in the permaculture world 
I'm going to demystify it here. Fair share literally just means doing to the best of your ability. So what you put in, you get out. If you try to put in 100%, if you're putting in 100%, then you can get back your yield. This doesn't mean that, you know, you slack at this. It means that you are trying to the best of your ability, and so we're going to share with you to the best of your ability. So we're being fair. You're doing work. We're getting work in return. Fuck, thank you so much for the lemons. And so that's kind of what those those three are. Not really going to dwell on them too much, but those are the core crux to understanding how permaculture is more than just a gardening practice, but is a lifestyle that you can live by. So straight into what's most important, and that is the zones. So that's understanding the zones. So what the zones is, is the zone is imagine your house in the middle, and then these are just the wakes. These are the the wakes out from the zone. So at the beginning is your house. This is where you live. This is the center of act activity. This is usually where the energy and the water are managed. Um, this is where you're going to be spending most of your life. Most of your daily activities are going to be here in the center at the house. This is where you're going to be living. This is where you're going to be working. This is where you're going to be raising your family. This is where you're going to be entertaining your friends. This is kind of where you're going to be doing everything. But this is also where you're going to be doing all of your planning. You're going to be doing your energy savings. This is where you're going to maybe have some indoor plants, maybe some things like some warm bins or something like that. Next we're going to go out is we go over to the kitchen zone. So this is kind of like your fast food. This is the stuff that you need quick access to. This is your salad greens. This is your herbs. Uh, this could be maybe, you know, in some smaller areas, this could be maybe you have some chickens real close to the house because these are, these are things that need daily attention. You're going to be looking at this and you're just like, okay, I need to make sure this is watered. I make sure this thing. These are also going to be the things that when you're ready to cook a meal, you're just reaching out there and you're just grabbing it and go. It's just fast, easy, but a lot of planning. This is a lot of maintenance and a lot of planning. But that's just your kitchen garden, so it's not going to be very big. It's just that kind of stuff. So then go out to zone two. Zone two is your orchard and your small livestock. So this stuff, it needs regular attention. You're, you're definitely going to have to come out here. But maybe in some situations, not daily attention. So these are things that you're going to need. This is going to be like where your fruit trees are, where your berry bushes are. This is where your, your, some of your veg plots are going to be. So this is going to be like, this is where you have rabbits. So of course you're going to feed your rabbits every day, but you're not necessarily going to have to give all of your attention to that. This is maybe where your, your beehives are. So this is, this, is a, this is the zone that you visit often to keep it healthy and happy. But it's not something that you have to be like visually watching every day to make sure that it um, doesn't fall apart. So this is a little bit less. We're, we're, we're going more and more hands off. This is the first beginning to get your hands off. So then we're going to the farm. So that's this one with the cow right here. So right here, this is the farm. So this is the farm area. So yeah, I trimmed up the beard quite a bit. Um, meme. Thanks for the ice cream. So this is the farm area. This is the part where you visit a little bit less frequency. This is maybe where you have your big animals, like maybe your cows. Your Maybe if you have sheep, this is where you're going to have your, your larger veg crops. Maybe this is where you're going to have your corn. Your stuff that doesn't require you to spend a lot of time. Stuff you're going to need to check on, but stuff that you can, you know, I'll just check on it later. And saying that you're going to check on it later is perfectly fine. That's what this. That's what your farm zone is. That's where we're we're zoning out. So as you see, we're getting farther and farther away from the house. So next, we're at your managed wilderness. So what the managed wilderness means is this is kind of a semi wild zone. This is what I mentioned earlier. This is called the edge. This is one of my absolute favorite parts in permaculture. This is where the magic happens. This is where you get to see, this is where your farm and wildlife meet. And you lots of fun things can happen. This is where new species of plants can appear. Because you're giving, you know, you're, you're maintaining it slightly, but you're not doing a whole lot. So um, this is where it's semi-wild. It's not intense farming or gardening. Um, this is where you might get some wood. This is where you're going to manage for your wildlife habitat. 
this is where you might be tapping your your maple trees and this could also be depending on how big uh, how big or small your edge is this could be where you're gonna craft to do some uh, foraging some wild crafting this is maybe we're gonna grow some wild herbs that you don't need to spend a lot of attention to this is where those are going to be uh, this is a managed area but you're managing it not very you're just you're lightly managing it you're wanting nature to kind of take over this spot so then we've got zone 5 and zone 5 is the wild area um, this is where you're kind of doing nothing. You're kind of just letting the land do what it's thing. Maybe you're coming in here and you're making sure wildfires don't happen. Maybe you're coming in here and you're, you know, cleaning up the forest a bit. You're making it kind of nice. You're, you're making sure that the pond is doing what a pond is supposed to doing. But this is where the biodiversity is coming from. This is where it's habitat for the wild animals that you really want on your, that you really want in your vicinity. So, in a nutshell, permaculture zoning helps you organize your land into different zones so you know what's appropriate and so you're not wasting your time or your energy working in the different in the different areas here. So, got the home, kitchen, orchard, farm, edge, wilderness area. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about sectors and layers. So sectors are about the external energies um, and the forces that enter and affect your land and your garden. These can be both beneficial and challenging. The idea is to design your space in a way that maximizes positive influence and minimizes negative ones. So what this is is you don't want this is where the idea is you're adding stuff to your farm and you don't want think you don't want too much stuff to be screwing up your farm. Yeah, thank you so much for the ice cream. Um, and this is where you're trying to balance out the bringing it in and take. So optimally, you kind of want the less, you want to have most things done on your farm where you have less influence coming in and less influence going out. So if you can keep your sector really, really small, that is absolutely cool. If you can't, um, this is where this is where the sustainability focuses on how you're choosing to run your farm, your homes, and your garden. So then, then the next thing we're going to talk a little bit about is layers. So layers are the layers are kind of imagine growing up. So layers are how you're going to tier your trees, how you're going to tier everything in your garden, um, so that you can mimic what a forest has. So let's give some examples of sectors. Some of the exact examples of sectors is the amount of sunshine coming into your farm. So you can capture that sunshine to create energy. You can utilize that sunshine for growing your growies. And by doing that, you can have things like greenhouses. You can have solar panels. You can have just the little micro um, cold boxes. So it's just trying to use what's already going to come into your already naturally going to come into your land and trying to utilize that so that you don't have to pull something else from from someplace else. So you don't have to bring in artificial lights. So you don't have to bring in um, other things of that sort. Next is wind. Wind is something that is absolutely going to influence your farm and your garden in lots of ways. So you want to make sure you have decent wind breaks. You want to make sure that you set up, you orient the way you have your garden set up, the way you orient your zones. You want to make sure this is set up so that it actually works with the wind and you're not actually worried about crazy stuff happening like the wind's going to blow over your tent, which is something that happens all the time for me because we have crazy wind and there's really no way to orient it here because I live down a slope from a mountain, kind of in a bowl, and the wind can do absolutely insane things here. Next, we talk about water. This includes rain or any other water, like springs, rivers, things of that sort that come onto your property. This also includes irrigation. So how are you going to mitigate? How are you going to work with the water to your benefit and to your detriment? And these are things that you really need to think about and plan. So swells are a great example. Seasonal ponds are good examples. Knowing how the topography of your land is set up so when the water flows, you'll be able to get that. Next is fire. So if you live in an area where fire can break out, you need to know what fire-resistant plants you have available. 
you need to know what stuff is just extremely vulnerable to fire. If you're going to be in the edge or the wilderness, like we talked about in the zones, maybe you go in and you do some light management of that during fire season so that that fire doesn't completely spread through your farm. Because fires, there's benefit. There's a lot of good things that you can do with fires. I use fires in my hay fields to help burn down some of the weeds when they get really too crazy. But then you also have to be aware that the fires can also be very destructive if you don't maintain them well. And then you have wildlife, and that is all of the animals that want to eat or destroy or mess with your farm. So, and what that means is that's you're going to have to identify the pest animals, you're going to have to identify the beneficial animals, you're gonna, that including the insects, that includes things that are just passing through. And you're going to have to figure out ways to work with them. Maybe you're going to need to put fencing. Maybe you're going to need to integrate different types of habitats. So that habitat that you're integrating over here so that the deer or those particular animals stay over there. So those are things that you're going to have to think about. There might be things that you need to attract this particular animal or this particular insect because it's going to eat this other type of insect. So next thing we're going to talk a bit about is we're going to talk about the layers, and we're going to start talking about canopy. So canopy is the high up tree. So that's just imagine when you look up and you see the trees and you see all the leaves above you, that is the canopy. That's the tallest part of the tree system. That's also good. That's usually going to be your major fruit trees, your maple trees, your trees for shade. That's what that's for is that's just going to be up there, and it's going to be protecting for shade and also provide you stuff. So then there's your sub canopy, there's your sub canopy or your lower level trees. Those are the kind that like, you know, come right over your head. Those are your, your dwarfs, your semi dwarfs. Um, those are going to also be fruit bearing. Those are the ones that are really nice to be able to pick for your apples from. Those are going to be the stuff that's just really easily right there for you. Um, and that's also going to give you a little bit of shade for other things because you know you got your big trees are more like your wind blocker and you're farther the next trees are kind of your shade trees and your easy to pick trees then you've got your shrubs that's kind of like your berry bushes or that's like your corn or that is the next layer so that's about head level so you've got way above your head you've got above your head and now we're at about head level and that's your shrub layer then we have your herbaceous layer and i did not say that word right but that is the next layer, and that's that's comprised of your herbs. So that's kind of, um, imagine that is like your garden layer. We're just going to call that the garden layer. That's your garden layer. That's the stuff at like, your waist and down. So that's the stuff where you're going to be able to come in, in there, and you're going to be harvesting. You're going to be picking. That's where you're going to, like, maybe your sheep's going to be, and your cows. They're going to be hanging out in that layer right there, too. So then there's your ground cover. Ground cover is your grass, your clover, your mulch. Anything that you're putting on top of the ground, that's your next layer right there. So your ground cover is going to be your, your low light plants. Um, it's going to be protecting the it's going to protecting from erosion and from your soil being able to get washed away. Then you've got your root level, and that is just right under the soil. So that's just like this much under the soil. That's where your worms live. That's where when you dig down, you find the, the lovely, beautiful worms. That's maybe where you're pulling up your carrot. That's where your carrots are living. That's where your like mycelia and your fungus are living. And that's just the nematodes. And that's just really focusing on making sure your soil is happy. So then there is one other layer, and this layer is kind of like just over here to the side. And it's your vertical layer. And that's anything that climbs up something. So that, that's a layer that's going to start from the ground, and it's going to go up. And that and that's just kind of on the side. So that's going to be things like your vines or trellises or any type of structure that starts low and moves high. So by, by designing these layers in mind, you create a garden, this ecosystem that is both highly productive and sustainable. It, what it's doing is it's mimicking nature. It's mimicking a forest. Because if you've ever been to a forest, and you'll notice that when you're in a forest, you'll see some plants growing on the thing, and then you'll get that stuff that, like, you're kind of walking through, and then you get a little bit deeper, and it's, like, chest, and then you're, you just, as you walk deeper into a forest, especially as a forest progresses through its stages, 
you'll see you can go in there and see all the layers. Now, as a as a forest matures, it actually some people think that a mature forest, an old growth forest, is the optimum, and that's just a stage because at that particular point, then those big trees are going to start dying down. The smaller trees are going to move up, and the forest is actually going to always be evolving and always changing. A forest is always changing. It's always going from a swamp to a forest, or from a meadow to a forest, and back and forth. It's always lots of stuff happens. A lot of times that's not happening in our lifetime, but it is still happening. So by, by going with these layer approach, um, we're not only increasing the biodiversity of the habitat, but we're also maximizing the production of space, especially with the vertical levels, and we're, we're knowing where everybody wants to live and making sure that they're living in their optimum area, making sure the plants are living their best life. So by uh, incorporating and understanding both sectors, the layers in your permaculture design allows you to be more effective, resistant, and produce systems by aligning your practices and the patterns with the natural world. So you're copying. You're just literally a copier. You're a copycat, and you're copying what Mother Nature has been doing for years, and you're learning from that because sometimes we think we know what's best, but those forests, they've been doing them for too long. So let's, uh, let's go on to the next slide. So planning, why is this covering up here? So planting the seeds of your garden. So you're just like, okay, doc, you've just explained to me permaculture. You've explained to me layers. You've explained to me sections. I know the zones. I want to get my hands dirty. So things that we need to pay attention to is you need to make sure that you find sunlight. Because knowing where the sunlight is going to be on your farm, on your garden plot, or on your growing bag. Knowing where that sun is. Because finding that sunny spot, because some plants really desire that sunny spot. Making sure your garden is breezy and is easy to get to in regular care. The reason I say it's breezy is you, want, you don't want it to be so stale right there. You want there to wind to be going through. You want things to be set up so that you're happy with where it's set up. It needs to be easy access. It needs to not be stale. It needs to have some wind. It needs to move the plants around. They need to be doing their thing. And it needs to be some place that you're going to regularly visit. So it also needs to have a little bit of shelter because what you don't is you don't want animals. You don't want weather. You don't want too much to like just be beating up your plant. You want to protect it a little bit. You want to baby your plants. You want to make sure that when you're doing your garden, your plant has what it would naturally, what it would have in nature as extra protection. Next, let's talk just a little tiny bit about soil. We're going to get into talking more about soil in future classes, but we're going to do soil testing. So it's a good idea to know the pH of your soil. Now, you can do this by knowing, by seeing what plants are growing in your soil, because the plants are also going to answer you a lot of questions. So if you know what plants are growing in your soil, you don't necessarily have to go get in a chemical test, but you should be knowing what your pH and some knowing as much about your soil as possible. So this is going to set your plan up for success. So I'll give a great example. I have fruit trees. I planted fruit trees in my backyard in soil that I created that was awesome. Those trees look great. I then thought, you know what, I'm going to plant some trees out in my hay field and another spot. I don't really need to maintain the soil because it's a hay field. I planted trees out there and they just did not do well. And part of that is because the soil is just not as good. So in the future, when I go to plant more trees out in the new future orchard, the two things I'm going to do is I'm going to be paying really close attention to what other plants are growing around. And I did that a lot this year or last year. I wrote down some of the wildfire, wild flowers that I saw growing in there. I wrote down some of the, the different types of other things. And I did some planning around, okay, if I'm going to plant some trees here, what can I do to give them the best chance possible? So I have those notes, and that'll be something that if I get fruit trees again this year, which I probably will, when I get fruit trees again this year, um, these are things that I'll be paying attention to to try to optimize the fruit tree survival rate and to have good quality fruits. Next is your soil, your toil, yeah, your soil TLC. 
So this depend on this is depending on what kind of soil you have. So some soil, like we mentioned out in the field, some soil needs to have more compost, more manure, or actually needs to have different types of nutrients added into it. Other soils need to be augmented with maybe some clay or some sand or some loom because we're trying to get a very good balanced soil for the plants that you're trying to grow there. Again, that is kind of how that is the best way for you to try to understand uh, what you kind of want. So soil health is super important when it comes to uh, raising your crops because the soil is where they're getting a lot of their nutrition from. They're getting a lot of the micronutrients. And, you know, you guys hear about how our food isn't as good as it used to be, mainly is because we have depleted our soil. We started playing, we started spraying toxic gink all over our soil, and that toxic gink did not make our soil thrive. And so it's our job as good, our job as good stewards is to make sure that we are just increasing the soil. And as we learn more and more, and we're going to continue doing more soil classes because soil management is something that um, is very, very important and one of the keystones to building a good garden and how to, to increase your soil. So um, different types of soils are sand, silt, clay. It affects plants that grow differently. A balance of these soils is ideal for gardening. It's also very ideal for certain types of plants because they actually need to have a balance. Some plants, depending on where you live, you just really need to find the closest to that as possible. So then we have to also pay close attention to the microorganisms that live in the soil. Those are going to be things like your bacteria, your fungus, your nematodes your protozoa, um, all these play a role. And what they do is they help decompose things. They're dying and they're eating the roots and they're eating other things and they're adding good nutrients back out into the world. And that's where they play a very big role. And then residue, something that's uh, I don't talk about very much, but it is something that does need to be brought up, is the organic residue um, that is the good and bad of growing particular crops. So some stuff leaves leaves an excess of something. So that could be like, let's say you're going to do a mulch and you mulch. So there are a lot of benefits to mulching, but there are things that if you mulch a particular way can actually hurt your garden for a year or so because you have to wait for those residues to get through the system. So these are just important things that you need to think about. You need to think about the carbon to nitrogen ratio as well. So let's uh, let's move on to the next slide. So there we were talking a little bit about soil health and soil health and the regenerative are the foundations to a sustainable agriculture, focusing on nourishing the soil's micro uh, microbial community, balancing soil compre um, composition and enhancing the nitrogen cycle. Key practices include managing organic residue, like we just talked about, adopting minimal tillage. So I personally try to till my soil as least as possible, but some plants actually require a level of tillage. So we want to do minimal tillage to preserve the soil structure, promote beneficial plants and the relationships between the nitrogen and the living mulches. So we also want to keep that. The, we, sometimes we don't want to do tillage because it can actually ruin soil fertility. Now there are can be benefits to tillage, so it's not just 100% don't do it, but it's something that you should not be doing regularly over and over and over and over and over again. So um, if you have to, let's just say you're just like, Doc, I live in one of those areas that because of this reason I have to. Well, if you're going to be having to till on a regular basis, you're going to be needing to till in good stuff. So you're probably going to need to be adding some uh, some compost in there. You're going to probably be adding in some different type of micronutrients and things of that sort. Personally, I like to go more of the holistic approach. I like long-term um, soil health, but that's just a practice that, that I prefer because one, I'm lazy, and two, I actually, Mother Nature doesn't regularly till up its soil. It does lightly till it, though. Worms, rats, mice, chipmunks, things that scratch in the soil, they are actually lightly tilling up the soil. So let's see. Um, oh, let's, um, I'm going to go back one. 
just because I want to talk a little bit more about the soil first. So we I do want to talk about the living mulches. So living mulches are things like grasses, clovers, certain types of weeds. Uh, they're very good to put into your garden, and they're very good to have that because if you are going to do a type of tilling, you can till those back in, and they're just kind of adding stuff back into your soil. So again, what we're main thing we're talking about is making sure that you're maintaining very good soil health to the best of your ability because there's always more that you can learn and as we go through these series you will see that there's more and more that I also can learn because we can also learn a lot but there's a lot of practices that I there's a lot of stuff I've learned and a lot of stuff I can share with you of ways not to do things of ways that I say absolutely do things that we've done over the course of the last almost 20 years. So why permaculture rocks? So two reasons. You can do companion planting, which is just plant stacking. So you do things like seven sisters or three sisters. You can really just get into some awesome um, awesome ways to have a little bit of space and grow a lot of really cool things. It's also really good in pest management. What do I mean by pest management? It means that you're not having to spray toxic gick on everything. It means that you are going to be growing the right plant and you're going to be or setting the right little ecosystem up so you're going to be attracting the predator bugs that are going to be eating the pests or maybe you're going to on the edge you're going to be planting certain things into that edge to keep the deer from getting into your garden. So that is why I think permaculture rocks. Those are just two examples. There are tons of them, but those are two very simple, easy to go examples. So permaculture in your backyard. So looking at me and saying, Doc, I don't got a big acreage. I don't have everything to be able to do all the fun things that it sounds like you're talking about. What can I do in my backyard? So even if you've got a small patch, you can still have a permaculture paradise. That can be vertical gardening. So if you see in this picture right there, that's growing vertically. So uh, I did an experiment last year. I took a bed frame, and it still's got the springs, like so a bed spring. And I took all the material off, and then I just put some planters in there. I let some stuff grow up it. And it looked like a piece of junk right off the bat, but in about... Um, maintained properly, it can act be really cool, and it gives lots of fun layers, and most of the time it's free. So you can say, well, maybe I don't, maybe you don't want to do that. You can string string up. Lots of great ways in your backyard that you can grow that. Um, you can catch water. So just, you know, maybe you're in one of those states like, but Doc, I'm not allowed to catch water where I live. Well, you can stick a cup outside and you can stick a little bucket and if some water happens to fall into that and then you pour that extra water into your plant I mean you weren't catching water you just forgot a cup outside so but anyways just catching um, catching your own rainwater if you really are just like you know what I'm a rule follower doc I follow all the rules I've never broken any law I don't do anything that the man says I can't do then just mulch around everything because what the mulch will do is the mulch will slow down the uh, evaporation of the rain it'll slow down the rain from moving off of your property and you're not breaking any rules by putting mulch down because mulch is a naturally occurring thing and the mulch is just absorbing it and slowly watering your plants the other thing you can do is you can attract beneficial critters this is pretty much like cool butterflies maybe some bats some hummingbirds, some of your other type of favorite birds. So yes, you should have bird feeders. You should try to attract the wildlife in. So what's cool is if you really know what you're doing, you don't even need a bird feeder. You just plant the right kind of plants around and the birds are just going to show up. You're just going to have cool birds there. They're going to eat what their favorite food is and then eat some of the other bad guys that are around. The other thing is, is you can have a beautiful, lovely, edible landscape. So you can have your front of your house just looking spectacular maybe you live in one of those areas where like i want to have a pretty yard and i want all my neighbors to love my pretty yard well, you can have a pretty yard and you can eat the stuff coming out of your pretty yard i think that's pretty neat to think about so 
I went backwards there. So, so we're going to get started. So how, how do you get started? So we're going to start real simply. Beginning your garden adventure. I want you to understand that you can do it. It's not anything that you need to worry about. I gave, we just talked about the fundamentals. We talked about just kind of the, the simple knowledge. And yes, it was basic. And there's a lot more that we're going to talk about. But it's time to start. This spring, which is just, for some of you, is weeks away. For others, it's a month or so, month plus away. It's time to start something. I don't care if you just get a pot and you grow something in your backyard, or like my buddy in the UK is doing, is he's growing potatoes in KFC buckets, and then he's going to move them to some of his, to his back garden. Or if you just get the fabric bags and you are growing something in the fabric bags in your own house, on your porch, on your balcony, in your windowsill, you need to touch grass. So I'm gonna. This is a great spot to mention where I specialize in. So. What I'm doing is my purpose here and what I like to teach folks is I like to show you how to use modern technology. I love AI. I love all of this technology. The future, we live in one of the best timelines ever. The future that we are going to is work is about to become a video game. But that means that we that means that it's going to be far more responsible to get out there and touch grass. We're going to have to decouple ourselves from the computer from time to time. We're going to have to get out there. We're going to have to touch grass. We're going to have to be out in the woods. We're going to have to get our hands in the dirt. We're going to grow something in the pot in our house. So that is where permaculture comes in. That's where permaculture shows us that permaculture, we can use the techie world to make life easier because that's what it's about. We're humans. We keep trying to make life easier. Life should be easy. We should just keep moving potatoes in your backyard to grow some tomatoes in your backyard, to grow, maybe have chickens, have quail. It's your responsibility now to touch grass and to get out there. You need help with this? I'm a life garden coach. I'm a garden life coach, whatever you want to call it. I can help you. We can, we can do private one-on-one -on -one meetings. We can go through very basic ways to help you with that, but... Or you can just get on the interwebs, and and there's someone that's going to teach you in the style that you want to learn. Someone's going to teach you exactly how to grow something that you want to grow. And you might fail. You might try one season. You're just like, Doc, I, I have a black thumb. I kill everything. Well, there's a plant out there that you're not going to, and with practice brings perfection. You want to fail up. Keep failing up. Keep trying and failing up. As you get better and better at failing, you get better and better at succeeding. I, I fail up with a lot of stuff in my life. So, don't let that be an excuse. Touch grass. Start a garden. Today. It's a responsible thing to do. So, let's cover some of the simple things that I just want to make sure that you understand. You only need a small space. Composting. Simple, easy. We're going to do a whole show on composting too, but composting is super simple. Just the easiest way, you're going to get yourself a bucket, you're going to put your table scraps in it, you're going to put some dirt, some leaves, some grass crippings. That's what you're going to do. Companion planting. You're going to figure out things that like to grow together. That's simple. That's all companion planting is. You're going to find two plants that are friends, you're going to grow them together. Water management, you're not going to waste your water. You're going to catch water when you can, and you're going to give high-quality water to the plants that you possibly can. Organic pest control, what that means is you're going to try not to spray toxic gick on stuff. You're going to work with nature instead of against it, so you're not spraying toxic gick, so you're not poisoning yourself or the world around you. And then you're going to master mulching, because mulching is like the super-secret trick that they don't want you to know about. You know, you know about mulching your plants out front and how well it does in your garden. Like you make your flowers and you mulch around your trees. You can be mulching in your garden too. Even in your little garden, your little pot garden that you're growing, in your little bag garden, you can even mulch there as well. So, something that you can absolutely do. And you should. So, besides the internets, Besides talking to me, besides all this kind of stuff, where can you learn 
this kind of stuff. So if you live in a city and you're not like me in the middle of nowhere, if you're living in the city, you probably have a local garden club, which we actually even have local garden clubs here. I know there's one in Beckley and I know there's one in Bluefield. So there's local garden clubs. You get to meet, you get to mingle, you get to talk to those people and they can help you. You can show your ideas. You can pass that kind of stuff along. Pass that stuff along. Other thing that you can do is you can find online groups. Things like this. Facebook groups. Places like my Discord, which if you want to come over and join my Discord, I think there'll be a link in the Discord later on, or you can just hit me up on whatever the social of places online um, where you can just join with a group of people and they'll help you thrive. So I teach IRL classes. Let's say that you are in southern West Virginia and you're just like, Doc, I'd like to learn from you. I don't really want private lessons or anything like that, but you teach classes anywhere, and I do. The Sustainable Garden Series at the Craft Memorial Library in Bluefield, West Virginia. So my next, cl my first class, I believe, is I don't know. I'll have it. Um, I will, I will link it someplace below. But I think it's the 13th of March. We'll be teaching about how to make your own soil. That's the first class I'll be teaching there. So it's just a if you if you want to learn from me firsthand. Um, also, if you visit the mavispharmacy.com and you scroll down just a little bit, you'll see my little calendar that'll tell you all the events and places that I will be teaching and classes, like when I'll be doing online classes, when I'll be doing IRL classes. That's something that you'll be able to jump into as well. So let's just say, you know what? I actually want special classes from you doc i want that extra special touch so so we have like i mentioned we have our discord that you can jump in but i also teach private gardening lessons so we can do private gardening consulting um especially if you're a beginner i'm really um i like really to talk to the beginners because with the advanced people you know there's there's lots of fun questions and i i learn a lot from the advanced thing and I can help with those too. But with beginners, like there's a lot that you don't know that you don't know. And I really like to help it. Plus, it's really fun just seeing someone start to learn how they can discover that they can start being somewhat self-sustainable, that they can grow their own food. So you can hit me up on the Mavis Pharmacy or you can hit me up at mavispharmacy um, at gmail.com. Send me a message there. And we can uh, we can talk about one-on-one -on -one gardening lessons, and me being your farm coach. So, embracing the world's um, and, jour and a journey into permaculture gardening. And I can't read tonight, but anyways. So we've got permaculture. Uh, we're going to talk more about that in future episodes. But we've got permaculture, which is the foundation to your mind to get you ready to get into to, to, um, this type of gardening, to get you into being able to succeed. We've got to worry about soil health and regeneration. We talked a little bit about that, on how to get into soil health and how important the soil is and why you want to make sure you have good soil. And we're going to have a more in-depth class on that coming up very soon. We have the start your garden and when is the best time to start your garden and the best time to start your garden is right now. It actually was last year, but since we don't we can't we can't time travel yet, you want to start your garden right now. Start your planning today, start figuring out what you're going to grow, start figuring out what you're going to put into your garden. And then we talked a little bit about where to learn. And the internet is full of places to learn. Maybe you don't like learning from me. That's fine. But learn from somebody because there's tons of people all over the place that are there to teach you and want to help you succeed. And I want to see you succeed. I want to see you take back control of your life. Our ancestors knew how to do this. Our founders, our, our forefathers, our foremothers, all those people knew these skills. And we've just... We've just started losing them. And as I said, and as this world becomes so more digitized and as we embrace this new gamify of the world which i love i think it's going to be great we also need to touch grass and we need to balance out you need to know where to put your skills in your skill tree 
and sometimes put in those skills in the skill tree is survival. You need to be able to lug the crap around. You need to be able to get out there. You need to learn some of the skills. And some of the skills that we're going to be teaching here as we continue doing these classes is going to be how to grow food, how to find food, how to grow animals, how to thrive, take back control. Whatever the TV says, turn that off. Turn off that TV. When you're in your garden, awesome. Doesn't matter what's happening halfway across the planet. Heck, it doesn't even really what's matter and happening inside your house. When you're in your garden and you're doing your garden thing and your plants want your attention and your plants are happy to see you and your animals are all happy, that's really what you're looking for. So, anyways, friends, uh, thank you for joining me on this fun adventure. We're going to just reverse back because, you know, that's not annoying or anything. So, I'm going to try to do more of these shows. Um, again, dlive.tv backslash xdrfirefly. So, you see the xdrfirefly right up there. That is, uh, that is my home base. That is where I do most of my live streaming. Um, I'm trying to expand out. This will also be available on YouTube, which is X Dr. Firefly Mavis. It'll also be available if you're just not a YouTube fan and you like a Rumble. It's Rumble X Dr. Firefly. So you should be able to find me on X Dr. Firefly just about everywhere. So, again, guys, um, if there's any way I can help, if you want private coaching, if you want private lessons, hit me up. We'll talk more about that. Other than that, I want to thank everybody for tuning in, and um, we will we will leave with another fun song. Maybe if I can get my mouse to go into the location that I want. Yeah, we're gonna we'll we'll play one more fun song um, this evening. So this is a the first song you heard if you were here during the opening cat the opening parts of the song. That was a song that I had actually created with AI. And this is another song that I created. In the garden, green Adios. thriving, nature's plan unfurls, where the permaculture blossoms in this intertwined world. There's a quack and a flutter as the ducks join the dance, partners in this life's ballet, in the sunlight they prance. Quacking round the garden through the day they roam Ducks in harmony in this permaculture home Eating pests and weeds, their nature's own brigade In the cycle of life, their roles are sweetly played With a splash and a paddle in the pond they glide, cleaning water as they go in their gentle stride. Their manure, rich and fertile, feeds the earth so deep in the circle of life. The benefits we reap. Oh, the ducks, my friends, in their feathered grace bring joy and balance to this sustainable place. With every quack and waddle, they teach us the way to live in harmony each and every day. Quacking round the garden through the day, they roam ducks in harmony in this permaculture home. Eating pests and weeds, the nature's own brigade. In the cycle of life, their roles are sweetly played. So here's to permaculture and to ducks so fine. Together in this dance, a partnership divine. In the rhythm of nature, a song we'll sing, a melody of life, in balance with the wing. You guys have a wonderful night. It's Doc.